Stanford University. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks for organizing this great uh, meeting. I'm um, second time here, and I'm really enjoying it. So um, job I got from Yasek, we discussed these uh, uh, presentations earlier, of course, is to talk about specific project and what we can do when we have assembled those data and what kind of biological sense we can make out of them. So we're going to talk about annotating of proteins. I'm going to tell you about that. So that's outline. First, we talk about uh, life sciences challenges and force paradigm. Then we talk uh, specifically about that project. And then we end with a um, new ecosystem for life sciences we're trying to develop right now. So first, let's go in the past, maybe, um, and talk about major grand challenges. Just a few examples of them. Um, they're all very different. They all relate to life sciences. Uh, um, but they all have a lot of um, commonalities. For example, let's talk about a little bit the Green Revolution. And I just put names of the major figures behind all those grand challenges and solutions to those. They had, you know, all these grand challenges had um, unattainable, you know, uber goals. And Green Revolution was, you know, you need to have high yield uh, disease resistant wheat. Um, data driven approach was major deal. Statistics play, played extremely important role back then, even 40, 50 years ago. Uh, it was interdisciplinary genetics, uh, plant sciences, agronomy, uh, agronomical sciences, a lot of technologies in breeding and soil, um, um, industrial scale technologies were used. Of course, it was collaborative. And also, it has supportive ecosystem. It started in the US. It had a major support by Mexico government. Then DuPont played an important role, Rockefeller and uh, um, mm, Ford Foundation, so it was, you know, it then became global. Um, this is, um, I think, very important when we talk about what's happening right now with uh, life sciences today. Um, we live in force paradigm, um, according to Jim Gray. I'm sorry for majority of you who knew what I'm talking about. I, I simply need to say it. Jim Gray postulated um, that uh, there are four major paradigms of science. So one is experimentation. Classic. Uh, another one is theory. Then mid last century, we got computers and modeling and simulation happening. And now it's data driven, data intensive, data enabled science. Of course, this is not just one or another. It's a combination of those. But this is very new in life sciences. As uh, Narayan answered the question, you know, physics started earlier, astronomy started earlier. In life sciences, we are in this um, force paradigm. And um, Importantly, that grand challenges we are faced with, they would require those kind of approaches like you know, grand challenges in the past. Um, one of the grand challenges, I'm not going to tell you about the grand solution, about one micro step towards that grand challenge is um, we produce all this data, and Eugene told about sequence archives, and Ryan told about environmental mega uh, sequencing projects. We produce all this you know, genomics data. Mm, and then um, what roles genes, specifically proteins, are actually playing. So we, mm, we made of proteins. So hair is one type of protein. So genes being transformed into proteins, OK? Life science is primarily interaction of many different uh, biological um, mm, entities, including proteins. So hair is one protein. This is another protein. All uh, environment, all our cells, all our microbiological, you know, um, mm, um, uh, communities, you know, live in us and outside of us. They're made of proteins. Um, so what we don't know uh, is function of those proteins. And uh, those new technologies, um, as we heard uh, previously, produce a lot of, you know, interesting uh, uh, data. Um, but uh, at the same time, on protein level, it was true 20 years ago. It was true 10 years ago. And it looks like it's going to continue to be true for some time. Approximately a third of proteins, we have no idea what they do. Even if you take the smallest, you know, smallest possible microorganisms of, say, mycoplasma genitalium responsible for one of the major diseases, our diseases, OK? Around 400 proteins, 25% of them, essential function, we have no idea what they do. 
So then propagate it on human level, propagate it on plant level, propagate it environmental level. This is reality we are uh, living with. Uh, what's uh, mm, more disturbing as you know, I'm really grateful to Eugene and Ryan, they made my life much easier. What is more disturbing in addition to producing all this data, our analysis and database and uh, um, integration capabilities uh, are basically uh, lagging behind. Some of the really great resources which were used even five years ago are no longer because of many reasons. So, um, so how we go about trying to uh, predict and assign function to proteins? We're doing it by alignment. I'm very sorry if it's too simplistic, uh, but you know that's basically we do pattern recognition, and it's basically done. Uh, Blast is one of the major tools, you know, um, developed by NCBI, and um, everybody in, in life sciences, many majority of people in life sciences know and use it. Um, so basically, it goes like this. So I, I use our um, host and organizer as example. I did ask uh, Jacek if he likes vanilla ice cream. He told me he does. So hopefully that's close to true. So basically, if you have sequence, and by the way, proteins uh, are made of 20 letter alphabet, very similar to uh, English alphabet, just reduced. So it's not really far fetched. So basically, you have protein sequence number one, and then you have protein sequence number two. And then you do comparison between those two. And um, you can see that in this case, it's 96% identical. It's really a nice case. If you know function of that one, uh, guild by cessation, you propose function for this one. And that's usually uh, the case. And um, one of the databases we decided to, uh, to revitalize, COG databases, is based on that principle. It was developed actually by NCBI. NCBI is like uber house in, in life sciences, okay? Um, and a lot of great uh, uh, people work there. So it was developed originally by Eugene Kuhn and David Lippen and their team. Um, it has over four and a half thousand citations, which is huge. You know, in life science, a thousand is one of the golden numbers, okay? Um, imagine if it was four and a, and a half thousand citations, how many were not cited, right? So everybody used that, and it's still being used. Um, it's based on very simple principles. So we basically have, you know, not two sequences which are similar by sequence, uh, but they are, you know, similar to third or fourth. So you basically have clicks or cogs of those sequences which are similar to each other. Most probably function of them are similar to, and most probably, you know, errors, you know, in assigning of those functions are going down the more sequences of similar, um, uh, uh, similarity you have, okay? That's kind of very simple idea behind the cog and it worked uh, really well. And it was, uh, what's disturbing is that it was last, you know, updated 2008 and last curated 2006 because of many reasons. Um, so that's not good. People still continue using it, but it's completely outdated with what we learned from Eugene and Ryan uh, presentations, right? Um, we not live in Moore law and live in very different time. Okay, on protein sequence level, all this, you know, uh, billion sequence translated in number of non-redundant sequences. Um, at some point it was one million and at that point I was, you know, going to meetings um, uh, and I was asking uh, people from outside of our realm, please help us to analyze them. Let's do simple test all against all. For you it's nothing, we cannot do it. That was one million when I started talking about that. Over three years of talk, we got to 10 million non-redundant protein sequences last year, and now it's around 14, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so it finally did happen. R R Roger Barja from Microsoft Research. I'm not sure Roger is here or not. Yes, that's him, that's Roger. <laughs> you know, he made it personal to him. So basically, they did this analysis of all against all non-redundant protein sequences, exactly the way, more or less, uh, we, we showed here, based on BLAST, okay? And, uh, mm, and as a result, he generated three billion filtered uh, mm, records of comparison, pairwise comparison. BLAST is pairwise comparison. So um, that was like fantastic. I remember uh, at that point I was expecting how we're gonna proceed uh, further, and then Roger told me, Jean, this is your hard drive, good luck. I didn't know what to do. So that was kind of uh, you know, a wake up call to, for us too. 
Okay, so we did do something when, while Roger was, uh, and his team was working on that, you know, um, 10 million against 10 million comparison. You know, we worked for years actually on developing some robust um, and the decent uh, model uh, based on uh, blast alignment, which is uh, basically length normalized bit score. Um, it's not what usually people do with blast alignments. Uh, specifics, I would be happy to answer you. I don't think it's important right now. So basically, we were ready to, to deal with it, but we are not ready to deal with uh, 3 billion sequences. So, um, um, so what we did um, is, is basically the following, and I'm going to come back to the, you know to to, to previous slide. Um, we, you know, two of our members, Natalie and Bill, implemented Hadoop um, on our um, our own cluster, 300 cores. I would like to thank Hadoop community. This is fantastic resource. Uh, we heard about it um, in last year, um, me personally, but you know, um, it was very. Uh, important for us to be able to work it out, and it was, you know, it was fantastic. It was empowering uh, capability. Now we can do stuff we couldn't even, you know, imagine we were able to do, even with really small micro, micro, micro cloud of our own. So then, what we used, we used old database, you know, of Cog, you know, five-year-old database, and use it as a starting point. Did a lot of training, testing on it, uh, with length normalized bit score of that criteria we got to that level of sensitivity specificity and uh, as a result we extended core uh, 30 fold which is not bad at all then we cluster remaining using le single leakage because it was really simple and straightforward thing to do and we wanted something to be straightforward and simple which we can test ourselves which we did using Amazon um, web services so uh, as a result of it the, the process looks like this so basically it took approximately uh, 10 million sequences Uniref non-redundant database, it used all COGS with this you know, uh, threshold, um, reclustered to new COGS. We did it for um, um, organisms of bacterial archaeal origin. Um, then leftover, we were single leaching clustered in protein functional groups. And we did similar with eukaryotic. It's, eukaryotic is more, um, um, uh, developed multicellular organisms like us, like um, animals. Um, and um, just want to show you how basically clustering was working. Um, so we have a um, number of complete clusters going like this, saturation happening really fast. Um, and then a partial number of partial clusters went down um, relatively well and then stabilized and we were basically were trying to to get it mature and that was done on both types of um, protein sequences and uh, um, as a result of it proof of principle we show that we're able to revitalize cogs which is important we can cluster the rest of the protein sequences which is important now we're working with original um, developers of um, um, cog system using more uh, sophisticated approach it's iterative blast um, and trying to uh, revitalize coke like completely fully. So uh, that's work is happening as we speak. Okay, say we're gonna do that, and then what? Okay, I think, you know, um, another point um, Ryan was making, it's extremely important. It, it should be um, used by um, our life scientists, and uh, it's really hard to deal with databases um, especially with such uh, sizes of databases, especially if you want to combine different types of information, you need to be more user friendly, you need to be, allow some uh, you know, capabilities which are not really well developed in our field. They developed in other fields, in industry, but you know, for life sciences, um, we are lagging a little bit behind. So one of the you know, important capabilities uh, um, for analysis, you know, it's visualization analysis. Uh, um, and uh, we work with Jeffrey Fox and his team from Indiana University using multidimensional staling to project all these millions of sequences um, um, to, to be able to do something like protein sequence universe, right? So this is just you know, a snippet of this uh, protein sequence universe for some of those cogs, and then they colored, you know, we just colored some of them. Um, uh, point is, it would be great to have such a tool which you know, um, basically um, do not depend on all against all. You can interpolate it more and more. 
because you know all against all it's a very expensive proposition. Um, it does make some biological sense. If you zoom in into that area, you can get some of those cogs which make sense from biological viewpoint. Some of them are clustered closer. They're a specific type of proteins called ABC transporter. It doesn't really matter. Point is, some of them are very specific transporters. Some of them are much more general, you know, much more universal. They work with different substrates. And that's represented in here. Um, OK, so why do we need to care? I don't know. This is my guesstimate. Um, if you think that protein universe and proteins doesn't really matter for you, I think you're kind of wrong. Because you know you are proteins. Proteins inside you, proteins outside you. Um, if you're thinking about personalized medicine, if you're thinking about environment, if you're thinking about food, energy, this is all you know game of proteins and substrates they produce. Um, so this does matter, especially now with all these new technologies we talked about during this session. Um, Primarily, we talked about genomics technologies. There are a lot of different other technologies. We are coming on the top of genomics technology. But if we stick with genomics technology per, uh, them, per se, OK? Think about $1,000 uh, genome, which is v basically reality in very, very near future, in a few years, OK? Right now, in larger centers, we're talking about 10K per human genome sequence. This is next step to insurable stuff. So you can do uh, analysis right now. Some analysis cost around, uh, you know, thousand dollars. Okay, so basically you can get your own uh, blueprint uh, of your genes. So that's why I think it's very important for you, and that's why I think you know, um, building uh, supporting ecosystem is so important, and it would be um, interesting to see how we can uh, go about that. Recently, you know, administration and office science technology you know, ask for a um, request of ideas, you know, uh, along the lines of um, uh, 21st by century, by economy. Um, where we are right now, we're generating a lot of data. We need to get to more information and knowledge to get to some action. In order to do that, we decided to, um, to come up with, you know, um, Data Enable Life Sciences Alliance. It happened because of um, it happened because of, um, um, primarily because of several workshops we were able to organize on behalf of NSF, National Science Foundation, where we brought people from different disciplines, from you know, different parts of um, life sciences, uh, different parts outside of life sciences. Was, we had people from physics, astronomy, different um, uh, industrial uh, um, uh, representatives, uh, foundations. And these are major major issues we are faced with. And I think this would be you know, most you know, relevant to this uh, to today's meeting. We need to create the uh, ecosystem, the supporting ecosystem. Similar to that, uh, supporting ecosystem was you know, uh, created, uh, those systems were created for grand challenges of the past, OK? Now we have a lot of grand challenges in life sciences. And uh, what we... Um, um, what we def how we define life sciences really broadly. So you go to Wikipedia, uh, so you're going to get first approximation of life sciences. There's a long list of stuff. So yeah. that's basically it, okay? And we definitely need um, um, those who are outside of life sciences to work with us. Because, you know, I know Narayan <coughs> skipped that slide about reproducibility. He talked about that. And, uh, you know, we in dire need e economy, um, uh, you know, and the... Um, Technology um, is fooling us. We produce so much data. You know, it's hard to, to be able to see how doing how we how good or bad we're doing on reproducible data. Then it becomes non-science. Um, Delta was proposed a few months ago. Uh, next meeting going to be a supercomputing meeting. You know, we were able to make deadline and we are granted workshop. So it's going to be in Seattle completely by accident. This annual meeting is in Seattle on November third. This is our current vision, which is, you know, uh, we're working on it as we speak. And this is our current mission. Again, I think, you know, um, importance to bring new expertises uh, to life sciences is hard to overstate. This is our team. Um, this is my family. And, 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 those, and those in red, they stick with me for a long time. And the same with collaborators, and the same with support. 
Um, okay, this is summary. Uh, we talked a little bit about life sciences challenges and uh, f in the past and force paradigm we live in right now. We talked about protein functional notation project and how we went about it. And we talked about um, ecosystem for life sciences which we trying to build with Delsa. So uh, my final pitch is um, basically if you're here, you're one of those. If you're one of those and you're passionate about this, get involved. Uh, participate in building uh, our ecosystem. Attend workshop, contact, talk to me, I'm here today. And um, just for fun, um, research is part of my life. Another part of my life being chief data officer, which is basically job to to use data as strategic institutional resource. We do a lot of analytics, predictive analytics. Basically how to be more effective and more high quality with uh, lean budgets or budgets which are going down. And it's, it's fun. So if you're interested in that, I would be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.